Every song, the objective is to make a hit. But for this particular song, we wanted to make something a little controversial. Every person, whether you're black, white, young, old, straight, gay, you all have relationship problems. Cheating is a part of people's lives. It's a reality. Who doesn't want to bang on the bathroom floor? Especially with the girl next door. They just don't want to get caught. Yo, man. Yo. Open up, man. Yo, my, my, my girl just caught me. You make a catch you? I don't know what to do. And, you know, what else? Say it wasn't you. All right. Honey came in and she got me red. You have to strategically write these records because we're thinking about airplay. Oh, I was worried about every single line. I'm like, call me on the counter. Re That's what you want to say, really? At that moment, the music gets shut off. Yeah, man, that one's not going to get finished and go on the album. Nobody could see this record. Played it for everybody. They just didn't see it. We were tanking. We were, we were going to be dropped. It almost didn't make it to the album. It's a song that almost wasn't. And then, you know, 10 million later. But she got me on the counter. Wasn't me. Saw me banging on the sofa. So this is where, as they say, the magic would happen. Um, it's such a long time, and the room is so different right now. There was a cockpit board. There were smaller speakers. There were like credences here with, with tape machines down here. But this room is the room that we did initially. Um, it wasn't me 20 years ago. You gotta remember dance hall in, back in the days was a niche kind of thing. We were in Britney Spears in in-sync mode at the time. There's nothing on the radio that sounded like, Oh, your favorite old man out into your villa. Just what's on a witness all it. It's, there's nothing that sounded like like that. I'm from Kingston, Jamaica. My mother migrated to the States. I came up and I went to Brooklyn. For me, that was like a melting pot of people. And I, I just really got into sound systems and music and became very good at it. I was in the crack era at the time when I was running with you know, all the little hustlers at that point, you know, as a young kid in Brooklyn. A couple of my friends got locked up. And when you see your friends start going down here and there, I'm like, yeah, I'm out of here. And I walked into a recruiting office. And I just looked at the Marine uniform and I was like, yeah, I could get laid in this. <laughs> How do I get into this? When we went to Paris Island, basic training, they used to run and sing cadences. And I would make these funny cadences up. I don't know, but I've been told, and you know, my CEO were patty hoes. Ooh, ooh. And it would make all the recruits laugh and, you know, and I ended up voicing O Carolina, which was my big breakout hit in this particular voice. O Carolina, my love, jump Carolina, come. But it's really like singing cadence. Who would have thought that the pop world would be like, yo, that's cool, we need it. <laughs> I mean. It ended up going all the way to number one and all of a sudden Virgin Records came to me trying to sign me for a million bucks. I know Carolina was the breaking ground for that. I ended up voicing in a studio called INS with Sting International at the time. It was his beat. Well, this is a Sting International studio. This is a custom Neve 5088 shell Ford console. We have a bunch of original analog gear. Yeah, we use this to keep the door open sometimes when the wind is blowing, you know? I'm Sting International, DJ, producer, composer, writer, sound system designer, you know, music motherfucker. This keyboard I actually played uh, Carolina. This piece of shit doesn't work. It's just a prop now. <laughs> it needs repair. When I first met Shaggy, I'm like, this guy's really nuts. You know, just there, all this animated. I'm like, okay, but that's what makes a good artist. Yeah, you gotta be a little bit nuts. This is uh, some of the records in the collection. You know, Sting International, he's, he's gifted. You know, he's a DJ. You know, he knows what works in the club. You know, just the way that record drops. 
him and I had this musical marriage, it just worked flawlessly. For the next album, I wanted to go back to more dancehall, more reggae reggae. Well, this is the archive, the tapes of all my work through all the years. This here, I pulled it out for you guys to see. This is the original recording tapes of It Wasn't Me. When we started production on the Hot Shot album, It Wasn't Me was the first record I recorded. It's just two horns. There's two horns and the violin. And I took my little $200 bass and threw the funk in there. A little kick. Fat. You know? Get this. Ah, ah, ah. And that's pretty much it. That's the groove. Anything after that is just uh, funky, you know? But hard hip hop, pop at the same time. You know, elements. So Sting International always gives me a cassette or a CD of, of a bunch of loops that he did. Well, The Wasn't Me was a little bit different because Shaggy just happened to come off tour and come by the crib and just heard the beat playing. That was just one of the beats that just hit me. It's all ear, you know, I hear it all, oh, yeah, and this beat just spoke to me. And I'm catching these melodies. And he heard it on the sound system in the crib. It was a real shit. So when you walk into the crib in your hand, boom, boom, pa, boom, boom, pa. Yeah, that motherfucker heard that shit. He wanted to be on that beat. So he took the beat, I gave it to him on a cassette. I used to have these little writing sessions with my friends. And Rick Rock was a little young writer that was there, so him and I used to just vibe. He never wrote a hit before or anything like that, but he had something about him, you know, and his work ethic, he loved doing it. He was quick, you know, and I liked that about him. Ah, <laughs> oh, gotta let him know. Shuggy! That's my Shaggy impression, by the way, in case you wonder. <laughs> I was a young, aspiring songwriter. I would write more, you know, like ballad type, in love kind of type stuff. At that time, there was definitely a sense that the stakes were high. Shaggy had just been dropped from his previous label. Whatever we did now had to be awesome. And we were sitting there one day. I think we were watching Eddie Murphy's Raw. He had a skit where he was talking about it. it wasn't me. Walked in the kitchen and said, what the hell was you doing in that bitch's house today? You know what the man said? Wasn't me. <laughs> and that was just a joke. And I said, why, why don't we just write that? So I'm thinking about the topic. I'm listening to the track. All of a sudden, pops into my head. And Shaggy's like, record that. He wouldn't usually come up with the DJ melodies. So no words, it's just melodies. Record that one. Right? And that's pretty much the process. And that was the whole melody and we just started from there. Shaggy became like a, a bigger brother to me. He was always giving me advice and he taught me this thing about, you know, the first line has to be like, pow, like in your face. And I don't know who came up with that line. But, honey came in and she caught me red-handed. That right there, you know something's about to happen. Honey came in and she caught me red-handed. Oh, crap. My aim at the point was to write adult content without being explicit, because we're thinking about airplay. Picture this, we were both butt naked, banging on the bathroom floor. Pretty straightforward. Mommy, while he's banging, he's really banging on the bathroom floor. It's easy, you know. I was worried about every single line. I'm like, I've never written a song like this before in my life. And she got me on the counter. Caught me on the counter. That's what you want to say? Really? And I'm thinking to myself, well, good thing I ain't singing it. I knew we had something special because we were all just laughing while we were writing it. Everybody came to the studio with the idea. And I heard it. I'm like, all right, that's fire. That's fire. We're going to do this. I think the intro was really Sting International's idea. Back in the days, I used to always make these uh, cassettes, these mixed cassettes. My cassettes were known because I always had jingles in the front or like these little skits. Once you hear it, you're like, what are they talking, what are they saying? They, they're having a conversation instead of a singing intro on the song. Yo, man. Yo. Open up, man. Yo, what you want, man? My girl just caught me. You made her catch you? <laughs> conversation, get them locked in. Then by the time they turn around, them drums come in, and that, mm, mm, pa, mm, mm, pa. 
Yuk. Picture this, we were both butt naked, banging on the bathroom floor. Rick Rock's vocal on that, you felt what he was saying when he sang it. I sound genuinely worried. Every line terrified me. You know, I hope nobody realizes that I wrote this song. <laughs> I'm just not that guy. I don't want to be associated with this. You better watch your back before she turn into a killer. I think the first verse is asking him, how could you let this happen? To be a true player, you got to know how to play. Never admit to a word what she say. And if she claims is you, tell her baby, no way. But she got me on the counter. It wasn't me. Saw me banging on the sofa. It wasn't me. I even had her in the shower. You got to have enough English in the record to grab people. Now you need to bring it back to the authenticity. Straight, hardcore dance off. You're not going to understand what the fuck it is, but it just sounds great. You are so in tune to try figuring out what the fuck it's saying. So you play over and over again, like, oh wow, for real, this, yo, this shit is really saying some shit. But if she back her gun, you better run fast. <laughs> but she caught me on the counter. Wasn't me. Saw me banging on the sofa. The bridge now was the important part of the record. So the concept of the record is, this guy is in problems. I'm the little devil player saying, tell her it wasn't you, fuck, you know what I mean? Lie. I'm like, chicks ain't gonna just dig that. You gotta apologize a little bit, and even if you don't mean it, it's gotta say something to balance it out. And I say, we gotta find something to sing back for the girls, you know? Wanna tell her that I'm sorry for the pain that I've caused. I've been listening to your reasoning. It makes no sense at all. So he's basically telling Shaggy, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I'm gonna keep my girl. I'm gonna try at least. The record is really saying that it's not good to cheat. It's a moral conversation as Sting would say. Yes. <laughs> My name is Hans Haydelt. I was at the time senior director of A&R at MCA Records. Two of my favorite pieces that I still have from my old memories of MCA Records are uh, my Shaggy 8x10 and then also uh, this great little photo of me with Shaggy. So the problem with Shaggy's career to the best of my understanding at the time that I met him was that he was a far bigger star in other areas around the world than he was in the United States. There was a lot riding on what was going to happen next in Shaggy's career. My job became going out to the studio to listen to the music. He showed up here, walks in with a bag of weed. Come on, let's get this record going. And I'm like, I don't smoke weed. <laughs> I'm sitting in the studio. Yes, I was a little bit stoned. Chaggy and Sting International left the room, perhaps to get food, and It Wasn't Me comes on. I'd not heard that song before. The vibe was instantaneous. At that moment, the door opens and Sting and Shaggy walk back in and the music gets shut off. What just happened? Yeah, man, um, you know, Robert doesn't like that song. Sting and I love it, but you know, I don't think he's gonna make the record. Robert Livingston was Shaggy's manager and so much more. And at that time, Robert was kind of the man in control of everything Shaggy. He called the shots on what made the record, what didn't make the record. They were not supposed to play that song for me. It just happened to be on the same dat that had already been playing. And Hans is like, look, man, I ain't no reggae expert, but this is a hit. I think you should finish it. That's what we're saying, <laughs> yeah, I mean. Sting took that as marching orders. He's not leaving that studio until that song is finished. So that night, I just mixed it. The next day, I'm like, take this shit off. We're putting this on. And they were kind of mad as fuck because the artwork had been done. But I didn't give a shit neither. It's actually a demo vocal, what you hear. The vocals are demo vocals. And so the song went on the album. When the label actually heard the finished 
proposed album. The senior executives thought the album was a pile of junk. There was not a song on there that they could release to radio. And I should be thankful that I still had a job. So nobody was supportive of any, you know, any of the songs I was really doing. You know, they didn't even like jump after Angel either. That was just an album track for them motherfuckers. What surprised me when they came back and they said, we didn't hear a single. And we have a great idea. We want to send you to Jam and Lewis. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis are two of the biggest producers in the history of music. And we ended up doing two songs. One of the songs was a song called Dance and Shout. Then of course, the senior executive staff were ecstatic because now they had their hits from Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis at a tune of probably $250,000 per track. It's either it's gonna happen or if it doesn't, you'll never get another deal anywhere again because it, look, it's reggae. You're lucky if you get a second go around in anything reggae in this business. Everything was sort of hanging by a thread. Put the record out, dance and shout tank straight out of radio, just did not do well, didn't perform well. I'm on the verge of getting dropped now on this label because the singles aren't working. There was no impetus from senior management to drive this home in any way. No resources, no promotion, no posters, nothing. Record label bullshit. We were tanking, we were, we were gonna be dropped. I sort of expected that my days were going to be very numbered. No one really had an interest in the project anyway, because I heard the backroom talk, you know, these coconuts. So I'm like, these motherfuckers don't give a fuck. One of the senior executives said, and I quote, let's say, get this fucking guy on a cruise ship doing limbo lines. Um, depression. <laughs> Depressing, it was rough, and that's, and we went on the tour to support it. We started from the East Coast and sat down on a bus. I happened to be in Los Angeles, and Shaggy was in Los Angeles the same night, and so we decided to get together for dinner. It was a pretty somber dinner. You didn't have to say it out loud to know what everyone else was thinking, and that was, you know, this is nearing the end. One of the biggest struggles that I saw, this tremendously confident artist, Shaggy, dealing with the internal struggle of failing. And all of a sudden, one of the people that worked at MCA, his marketing director at the time, gets a BlackBerry message. Out of nowhere, there's a, a DJ out of Hawaii that started to play It Wasn't Me from the album. All right, here we go today. Thanks for joining us. It's Jamma 957. My name is Bob Lump. In 2000, I was an afternoon DJ at KIKI. My job as being a music director for Hot 939 in Honolulu was procuring music. I heard that the DJ in Hawaii, he tried to reach out to MCA to get a copy of the album, the promo album. I mean, they were basically like, fuck off. You know, we're not sending any more out. We gave out however many. So he wound up grabbing it off a of Napster. You know what, the way you say it and the way it sounds like it, like I did some shady underground downloading thing. Like, I just wanted an edge. I wanted it to be better than every other radio station in Hawaii. So that's when I started scouring the internet. I saw Shaggy and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna download that. It's his new album, no one's got it yet. I didn't even get it really a chance to listen to it because back in the day when you download stuff, you just download it and you wait. And you just hope you don't hear that modem sound ever again. But I threw it on a CD. And on a Monday, when I was just driving home, Shaggy's It Wasn't Me came on. And when you listen to the record, it's a one listen record. It's one of those records where you're like, damn. I found myself singing the damn song halfway through the song. Picture this, we were both butt naked. So I walked into the studio. I put it into the CD player, press play. Listen to like the first bar. Next thing you know, I started looking to the left. And that's where the phone lines were. And right with the phone lines, one started blinking, two started blinking, three. And I'm like, ah, okay, I'll get to it. Let me enjoy the song. But once the hook came in, butt naked, banging on the bathroom floor, I looked over to my lines, and next thing you know, all six of them were going off. Hot 939, hello. Hey, brother. Hey, who this right now on the radio? Oh, my man, it's, it's Shaggy. It wasn't me. Oh, thanks, sir. Roger. Get in, bye. Hot 939, hello. Uh, it's Pablo. No, 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 no. Who's this on the radio? Oh, Shaggy. It wasn't me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. 
This song reached everybody on the island of Oahu. There was so much reaction from every radio station in Hawaii. Can we get this record as well? The label goes, we don't know how, we don't even have it. I've got the only copy of Shaggy Wasn't Me. And all of a sudden, he was playing it 10 times for the night, back to back. Imagine we had started a tour on, on the East Coast. We're coming up to flap shows, flap shows, flap shows, flap shows, flap shows, all the way down till when we hit the Midwest. The show the night before, two, 300 people. The next show after that is Albuquerque, New Mexico. When we leave the hotel, going to the show, there's police with sirens and everything. The amount of people are outside and cannot get into this fucking venue. Are they here for us? <laughs> it's like, yo. And we played, and it was fucking pandemonium. Honey gave me that she called me red and it creepy with the girl next door. Picture this, we were both butt naked, banging on the bed. When we dropped it Wasn't Me, we played it four times back to back. We couldn't even hear the song, how loud they were singing this record. We were like, what the fuck? The record started blowing up and started coming up the East Coast. And it just never stopped. It just never stopped. For the first time, in, and the only real time in my professional life, I saw a song that just bubbled to the top all by itself. And the album started selling, and started selling. A half a mil a week in sales. This is hard copies. And then, you know, 10 million later, you know, it wasn't me. It almost didn't make it to the album. And oddly enough, it's what propelled the album to the 10 million, there it is, 10 million sales. It was number one in almost every country. I think in every country. Then of course, after it's selling in millions and millions and millions now, all of a sudden everybody's, yeah, you know, we did great, you know, all this bullshit. Like as if they did something. Nobody at MCA Records lifted a finger until it became unstoppable. And they chase. It's been like that my whole career. Most records this year, 10 million sold worldwide. And broke then, some records. Yeah, broke some records. It's, 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 it's a first for reggae music to sell this much record in, in such a short space of time. We started what was a dance or a revolution at that point, which right after that, Sean Paul came with Dutty Rock. All of a sudden, from major labels, they were like, oh, this thing can really sell. It was that important to the genre of dancehall. It just became popular and popular, and a new generation just caught on to it, and it became this cult. It's not just a song anymore, it's like a, a cultural thing. Any time a politician gets in trouble now, it wasn't me, it's the go-to. Yeah, it wasn't me. I, I, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. You know, that's what, you know, that's what they do. <laughs> but I guess we may have made a problem a little bit worse. The record still sounds fresh when you listen to it. The melody's there, I guess. The groove is there. People fuck on the side, they get busted. They ain't never gonna get old. I, am, I always brag and say 11 people bought homes out of that and started their lives from that record, from that album. I thought I'd be a songwriter at most. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd become a, a singer. I had no intention of, you know, me singing it. To stand up in front of a crowd, 70,000 people, and be able to hold out the mic and have them sing every word is the coolest feeling in the world. It's quite humbling and honoring. Looking back now, the story of it, it wasn't me, is just a series of happy accidents. Had I not accidentally heard the song, who knows, would it have been on the album? No, it wouldn't have been. Remarkable. If it wasn't for Hans, I would have been like, man, fuck these motherfuckers. He's the one that said, dude, I think it's a hit. You should finish it. That motherfucker right there and that DJ who ripped that shit off of Napster <laughs> in Hawaii. I don't know his name. and I never met him. But thank you, motherfucker. Good job. In the past 20 years, I've yet to play a song on the radio. Now people are like, what is this song? Who is this song by? 
you know, I was just happy to say, Shaggy, it wasn't me. If there's one person who's watching this that I really want to meet, I want to meet that guy who uploaded Shaggy's Hot Shot album. I just want to know, how did, how did it get to the internet? That's the only question left unanswered. We made something so special that the world had to stop and take notice. Like, who the fuck are these dancehall guys? I got Shaggy from when I was in Jamaica. I was this really skinny guy. My hair was really light. And they call me Shaggy like a Shaggy dog. People do think it's from it's Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, and I just look at them and say, really? <laughs>